All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insights interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. And today I'm joined by Kara Brookins. How are you doing, Kara? I'm well, thank you. And where are you today, Kara? I am by Little Rock, Arkansas. Excellent, excellent. And Kara, if you haven't heard of her, is best-selling author, professional speaker. She's even got uh, the movie of her of her great uh, experience building a house with her kids from YouTube videos. Has been optioned as a movie in Hollywood, which is really exciting. And that was the genesis of um, your book and your speaking and everything. Was basically doing something that you had basically zero qualifications to do. Is that right? <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> but doing it anyhow. <laughs> yeah. So so I mean let's get let's get straight into it. So um you know going back to that what made you decide that you know building a house with your kids was a good idea? You know, I think like so many things it's being taken all the way down to the bottom. And that's where I was in my life. I I'd, mm-hmm. I'd been in a really bad marriage. I was a victim of domestic violence, had four kids. Uh, so I was in a position where I really needed a major boost up mm-hmm. and I'd been doing this, you know, everybody says, take little baby steps, just do a little thing every day. Well, I was doing a little thing every day and I was getting really little places, <laughs> you know? And so I decided the kids and I had to do something that would give us kind of a leap to a better place. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't going to do those tiny things anymore and we needed a place to live. So it seemed to me like the most logical and obvious solution <laughs> that anyone in my situation would do. So how did your, uh, initially, how did your kids react uh, when you said, you know, we're going to build a house? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they were all in right from the start. They were 100% in. And I think that there are two reasons that they were so, you know, gung ho to do this with me. One is that. You kind of think your mom is sane and has good ideas. (laughs) You don't think she's going to lead you down a terrible path. Uh, So they trusted me was one. And the kids were 17, 15, 11, and two. So the poor toddler didn't have a great vote in this. He Mm -hmm. just had to be pulled along. Mm -hmm. Uh, But everybody else did vote. And, you know, I think the other reason that they went along is because They had lived the same life I had. They had been pushed all the way down. They had seen a life with no control. You know, no matter what they did, they couldn't make our situation better until we had this idea for the house. That was the first time that it was like you can physically do something that will make your life better. And I think, and the interesting part, I mean, you used YouTube videos and tutorials right. and stuff to do it. But what I find fascinating about that is um, we often hear of people in circumstances, not even, you know, not not as bad as the ones you were in, but in everyday circumstances, and they're presented with obstacles and it kind of freezes them. But we're in a, we're, we live in a world now when we have so many tools at our fingertips that, you know, we should never be frozen, Right. That's so true. And really, when we did this, I've lived in the house for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So YouTube was in its infancy. It was was early days. Uh, There were no YouTubers. That wasn't Mm -hmm. a word yet. We didn't have smartphones. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, I had an old Blackberry that didn't even have a camera on it. So, you know, we had to go and sit around the family computer, but it was the first time that instead of going to the library to look things up Mm -hmm. or even looking at a a blog online, it was the first time that we really could see video of how to do things. And that changed everything for me. I could have an expert on anything I wanted show me how to do something, even though at that time it was a bit grainy. (laughs) Our cameras weren't as good then, but still anything I wanted to do, I could find. Yeah, and and it's obviously progressed a huge amount. I mean, I've actually oh. I've actually even done some stuff in the home using YouTube videos, but I'm trying to keep it a little bit on the down low because I've <laughs> passed myself off as a really not a handyman for so many years that I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want my wife to think that I can do a lot more than I can. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so can she do a lot more than she thinks, she, she, or than so, you think she can. Oh, you know, she can sure. be out there fixing the car or the lawnmower as well. <laughs> exactly. No, absolutely. Um, so uh, just just getting back to this. So when people often see obstacles in front of them or when they start off with a task, sometimes they get they get super excited and then they see the reality. I mean, like you, I mean, it's super excited. I'm going to build a house. And then probably you had that reality moment. My goodness, 
building a house is a pretty big deal. How do you advise people when they, you know, maybe they want to do something and they get excited about it, but when they suddenly, when the realization of what they're attempting uh, comes upon them, they they stop? Yeah, that fear paralysis. And especially in the beginning, we had that every day because every day we came out to the construction site and we didn't know how to do a single thing we were supposed to achieve. And I realized really quickly, we had a nine month deadline to finish the whole house Mm -hmm. because I had a nine month construction loan. I realized we don't have time to stand around, you know, twirling our toes in the sawdust. We have to build a house. So it it started with this little thing I started saying to the kids, okay, if we build this diagonal wall or if we set this concrete block and we do it wrong, what's the worst thing that could happen? Right. And that's how we got past the paralysis because they started out saying things like, oh my goodness, I could cut my arm off and an airplane engine could fall out of the sky and crush me. (laughs) And they came up with these ridiculous scenarios. So I would, you know, pull them back in. What's the actual likely things that would happen? Mm -hmm. We've learned how to use the tools. We're not going to cut off our left arm. Um, Pretty sure an airplane engine is not going to fall on me today. So what's the most likely thing that will go wrong? Well, almost 100% of the time it was that we'll do it wrong and we'll have to take it apart and do Mm -hmm. it again. Right. Well, can you live with that? Mm Because we did that 12 times yesterday. (laughs) And we just got to this sort of mindset of if you can live with the worst case scenario, there's nothing left to fear. Yeah. You know, once we had that, you could jump into anything. Even if you knew you were doing it wrong, you knew you were figuring out like a little bit closer to how to do it right every time. And and we really did dive into some crazy complex projects. And, you know, the first time I said, bring me that piece of wood, I knew I was cutting it wrong. <laughs> I, and yeah, it's, re- it's really interesting. And um, just that point about the what's the worst that can happen, because I think a lot of us um, and, and I know this would resonate with, with some of our audience, you know, a lot of people do think worst case scenarios, but they do. They're almost like your kids. I mean, sometimes they, you know, we blow these things up like, oh, what could happen if if this happen if I don't if I do this, this could happen. Happen, but the re- but you're right. If we rein ourselves back into what's the likeliest worst case thing that happened, as I like to say, in most of our jobs, thankfully nobody dies, right? Right, and even you know, I talked to somebody this morning who was talking about getting up on a, a very small stage and just saying a few words, and they mm-hmm. said they were terrified. And I said, what? You know, all of the people in the audience, Mm -hmm. they all want you to succeed. Nobody there is hoping you'll fail. And let's say you stumble over some words. Are they going to throw you out? Are they going to ridicule you? What's the worst that could happen? Mm -hmm. No, they're going to give you another chance to do it again in a week if you want to. You know, and so once you've identified that scenario and realized, like, that's not going to kill me. And if indeed the scenario you identify could kill you, if Mm -hmm. you could fall off a cliff, then make sure you take the precautions and learn how to use the tools tools so that you don't hit that and be aware of your risk because that's important too. A lot of the things that we did on the construction site were dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we had to constantly be evaluating evaluating it and not just leap into everything without knowing, okay, I need to wear these safety glasses. Hey, I should watch my fingers while I do this (laughs) part. You know, somebody always had to be assigned to the two-year-old on the construction site. You know, so there are definite precautions that you identify in that, but you also just sort of talk yourself out of that fear because most of the time we're being ridiculous and we're taking ourselves way too seriously, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's the thing. Once we learned how to laugh at ourselves and laugh at our mistakes, you know, then, then it, it all, it all broke down. But there's one other thing that we did and that was, I spent all of our money on the supplies. Mm. There was no way out. (laughs) You so, know, uh, here's this whole mountain of supplies. You've got one way to have a place to live. You've got to put it together into a house because you can't hire it done now. So basically, you remove the get any get out of jail cards, right? You basically I, said, "This is it. It's this. We either do this or we don't." Oh, no, <laughs> it was we do this. Yeah, you know, it was it was exactly that. It was sabotaging our plan B. Yeah, uh, you know, we had gone with plan B for too far in our life, so it was like putting all of our eggs in that basket. If if today what we did didn't work, then we better work harder tomorrow and figure out how to make it work because this is our one way 
you know, to have a place to live that we're proud of, that's safe, that's secure, that, you know, we can accomplish this thing. So, yeah, I, I, and I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's something that I apply so much to my life now, even in transitioning from being a computer programmer to a, a full-time speaker and writer is this, hey, let's jump off this cliff. And <laughs> there's no safety net, but I've put everything in place. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. It, it's, it, just come back a moment to something you said earlier about the person stepping on stage and you were saying, you know, everybody mm-hmm. wants you to succeed, right? I think sometimes maybe it's it's ourselves that, yeah, everybody wants us to succeed, but we don't want us to succeed enough. Sometimes it comes from within, right? Uh, That's so true. And part of the reason is because, well, what if the next week they ask me to step on stage for 20 minutes? Or, you know, what if they want me to do this all the time? (laughs) Uh, You know, I think the fear of of success is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And we often project a lot more potential success onto our fears. You know, well, what Mm -hmm. if they asked me to be in a movie three weeks right. from now because I was on stage for five minutes. You know, we, we project some ridiculous amount of success. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I spoke with a man who said, I, I want to be, you know, a speaker. I want to write books, but I don't want to be famous. And I was like, well, you know, I, I understand you don't want the paparazzi following you around, but really, if you've taken your, your speaking and writing career to that level in yeah. your mind, um, and you don't want to go there, then you're holding something back. And mm. and that's not fair to the audience. You, I want to do this, but I don't want to do it so well that I'm famous. Yeah. Um, you're holding something back. And the likelihood of, you know, the location you live, et cetera, the paparazzi <laughs> coming after you is really, really low. Mm-hmm. So your fear of success that's holding you back is is all based on a ridiculous future projection. Mm-hmm. And I think we we all do that a lot. Yeah. So what was one of the what was one of the most surprising things you learned early on in the project? And I don't mean from a you know construction point of view, but mm-hmm. maybe about yourself or, your, or about the situation. What was something that really surprised you? Uh, from from a more yeah, not physics. <laughs> lots of things surprised me. Sure, physically. I can imagine that. Um, but from a, a more emotional standpoint, you know, I had four kids. And I had been a single mom, you mm-hmm. know, for a long time and dealt with a whole lot from, you know, stalking and domestic violence. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was reasonably close to my kids. I knew that I had I had a, a long way that I could go as any parent does. Mm-hmm. But what I realized once we started building is how bad our relationships were. Mm-hmm. Um, not that we were fighting, not that we were arguing. We never did that, but they were silent. Yeah. That we hadn't learned how to communicate with each other. We hadn't learned one another's, you know, personalities and talents very well. And boy, let me tell you, when you are on a construction site for up to 20 hours a day for nine months straight, you know each other really well. And we went from, you know, just having to use a whole lot of words and poorly to try to communicate with each other to being able to very specifically and succinctly communicate a need or, you know, help with each other to by the end, we're like sort of grunting and motioning off (laughs) in an area and everybody on the job site knows exactly what we mean. You know, so it was that, that level of, of communication that when you are truly in sync and when you have one goal, and that Mm -hmm. was the big thing is that for the first time, we all had this one massive goal. Uh, it can really improve your communication skills and show you all the problems that you had. And that's an, and that's a, that's another fascinating point because I think what happens in many organizations, if we take it into organizations, is the, the organization, the company, it may have an overarching goal, but people don't really latch on to that overarching goal and they spend their time down in their own silos doing their own thing and therefore you never get that level of communication because people aren't truly aligned to what the goal is or the goal hasn't been articulated well enough. Oh that's so true I mean it it was like the epitome of a teamwork situation Mm -hmm. Um, and also as you know as a leader in that situation where here I am trying to lead my children to do this thing but I had to trust them. Mm -hmm. They had as much knowledge about how to frame a window as I did because they had watched the same YouTube video. You know, we were all coming into it uh, from leader to team members with an equal amount of knowledge about how to build a house, Mm -hmm. an equal amount of knowledge about how to use most of the tools so that even though it was my job ultimately to lead them and to keep the attitude positive and to, you know, sort of be the cheerleader, I was right there in the trenches working with them. And that's an effective team when the Mm. leader is right there, not only learning with the team, but trusting when my 11 year old is like, no, that's not how that (laughs) corner should be framed, that I could trust her and say, "Okay, can you show me? Right. You know, 
Yeah, <laughs> that's an amazing it, it, dynamic. It, it, uh, yeah, and it, but it it it's it's translates to every leader in teamship mm-hmm. environment that I've ever been in, and I can identify so many places, you know that that teamwork went wrong, and see how doing the same principles that my kids and I were using out here, you know, knee deep in freezing cold mm-hmm. mud, would have improved that you know IT team I was on. Right. So how do you um you know for people listening now how do you keep it going now that you're doing other things in your life and maybe you know you've had some success so maybe you don't have the same the downside isn't as great as it as it was back then how do you keep the same level of focus and motivation going forward how oh, i struggle with that like everyone but i am a very optimistic por- person and i'm a very goal oriented person mm-hmm. and i will drive really hard toward any goal so uh you know, I think that that my challenges are more in sort of reining it in. <laughs> I, I mean, it really is in that, you know, I've set this goal and I will sacrifice anything to reach a goal. And I think that what I found now as I have, you know, doing more of, of speaking and those sorts of things that I now have to find the ways that I give myself permission to take back some of the things I had sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Sleep, for right. example. The number of years that I'm like, well, if I only sleep five hours a night, that's this many extra hours to work, Mm -hmm. you know, so that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make in order to reach a goal. Well, a sacrifice should that should be a temporary thing. At Mm -hmm. some point, I have to say, okay, you've attained this thing you were trying to attain. Give yourself back those hours of sleep or whatever else it is. So, you know, and, and I think it's so many, especially so many entrepreneurs face that it's it's just finding balance. And mm-hmm. when you work for yourself, that's really, really hard. Um, so finding balance and then finding focus, because I'm also interested in 500 things. Right. So, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> narrowing that down and saying, you know, it isn't this is my goal, but this much smaller, you know, narrower scope is my goal. And, um, and I'm only going to do it this many hours a day. Yeah. And I think that's, for me, that's a huge one. It's something that I I talk about a lot is the idea of focus, because, um, as you say, you know, we can come up with 5000 things to do. Um, But also, I always feel that uh, people are reluctant to make choices. So if you if you have a bunch of different things going on, and you don't really focus on the most important one, it means because if you focus on the most important things, you have to unfocus or like unchoose the other ones. And people don't like to do that. They like to kind of hedge. And I think and part what of you're that saying, is that fear, right? Yeah. It's fear that if you put everything in one and everybody mm-hmm. knows, and I did that with, with the house for sure. I was putting all of my focus into this one thing. Mm-hmm. If that failed, the sum total of my effort for everything I was doing would be a failure. Mm-hmm. But if you sort of hedge your bets and you're working on these five different projects, then you almost are like fooling yourself and everybody else. Well, if one of these fails, it almost mm-hmm. doesn't count because there's these other four things. But really, you're doing all five of them badly. Mm-hmm. because you're not focused. So yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really, <laughs> really common problem. Mm-hmm. And it's part of that, okay, throw away all those plan Bs. What's the one thing you really should be doing? And most likely, that's the thing you most want to be doing. And yeah, put it all in and let everybody know. When I built the house, my goal was not to be a house builder. Mm-hmm. I do not want to build houses <laughs> for a living. So I have a huge concrete sign that my dad helped me make that's sitting in front of my house. And it says Inkwell Manor because this is and I'm sitting in a huge library Mm -hmm. that I built house because my goal was to be a writer. My goal was to write more books and to do the speaking. So, you know, I'm I'm declaring to everybody in the world, everybody who drives by, everybody who's seen a picture of my house, that this is the place I'm going to write books. Declare it that loudly. This is the thing I want to do. Put it yeah. in concrete, literally. Yeah, and and I love that because that uh, that is getting, you know, what the theme of what we've been talking about. That is literally give, removing your get out of jail card because if you pronounce it to the world, well, you kind of have to deliver on it, right? That's but it's it's liberating. Uh, it's scary, but it's kind of liberating too. It is. It really is, and you know, it's a constant reminder. Uh, you know, when I'm out there mowing the lawn or working mm. in my garden, I'm not going to forget what I'm here for, you know, what this is about. So, yeah, it's a constant reminder to me as well. I'm, and this, I, I built a library. I'm going to bump mm. into it every time I walk downstairs, mm. you know. Yeah. And so it's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic message for people is really, you know, you got to find what is the what is your most important goal, focus on it, declare it and go for it. 
Right. And, you know, sometimes it means doing something else to get there Mm -hmm. in order to have a place that I could live in expensively, that I could work in with a library. I had to build a house, which was sort of a sidetrack Mm -hmm. from my goal, you know, but ultimately it led me there. Yeah, no, and that's and I agree with that, too, because I think sometimes sometimes you go on a path and the path leads to another path. It doesn't lead to a destination. And sometimes you got to go from right. path to path and eventually it leads to a destination. But nothing in life is linear, right, as we know. It's so true. <laughs> sometimes you have to work the day job a little bit longer in order to build the side job mm-hmm. to be what you want it to be. You can't just, you know, I'm all about leaping out and taking this massive step, but doing it in, you know, a, a, obviously an intelligent way. I had the money that I could borrow to build the house. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't walk out here with no 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 supplies at all sure. and, you know, try to whittle it out of a tree. Uh, I had a great job as a programmer. So, you know, I think that you still have to set those things mm-hmm. up. And I worked both jobs, writing and programming. You know, I was a programmer for 18 years. So, you know, I worked both of those jobs simultaneously until I could build the other one up that it was, uh, you know, sustainable. Mm-hmm. So uh, as we come up to the end of the time, what's next? Uh, what's next for you? Oh, I am headed to Madrid next week to speak at a a conference put on by Google and YouTube. And uh, then I I have a couple more as soon as I come back to the States. I'm going to hang out in Madrid a couple of extra days. I've never been. so. Um, And then we are working on the feature film. So we are almost done with the script, the studio, and the actress will announce hopefully by the end of the year. Wow, that's exciting. And I'm working on a TV show. So, you know, I know I said focus, focus, but they all have the same theme. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And if people want to learn more about you, it's carabrookins.com. Yes. Uh, ab- absolutely. Excellent. Well, listen, it's been a fascinating conversation. I know we could talk a lot more. I, g- I get that feeling. Um, but we'll leave it here for today. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, Kara, for joining us.